First of all, thank you very much for asking them to get to uh, all this presentation. Very much appreciated. Uh, it may be useful if I start by telling you a little bit about the Day One Syringe programmes in Glasgow. That's essentially why I manage the uh, Day One Syringe programme across 68 different sites. Uh, this is very similar to, to, to Bristol, the amount of needles that's given out, we have about 1.2 million needles per year, 134,000 uh, transactions, so an injected population of around about, about 12,000. I'll show you the presentation and relate back to uh, injection of all uh, imaging performance enhancing drugs uh, as well. I still can't get used to that term, in imaging performance enhancing drugs. We started the clinic six years ago. It was called the steroid clinic. You know, and then the terminology changed. So it was in the beach clinic, performance and imaging enhancing drugs. Uh, after that, it was the siege clinic, steroids and imaging enhancing drugs. I never thank the buddy at home. That's now uh, the Glasgow High Guest Clinic. I think we just calls it the steroid clinic. So if you like, I, I also work in, uh, I manage to work in the uh, I've got a guest clinic uh, I've done so for the past six years. So it's really that kind of experience I'm going to share, share with you today. So that was a relatively short presentation. Uh, I was doing an outline with, with Jane. She said, yeah, definitely want to know about the prevalence in the UK. And if you can talk about the prevalence in Glasgow, that would be, be great. And also about the kind of nature of use as well. The, the different substances that the people are using, good for staff to know that. Or well, if you could talk about some of the side effects and things as well, a bit maybe we get to know and maybe how you set a clinic up. It was like some kind of game of bingo or something, so I got a full house. I'm trying my best to help. Okay, the, the UK panels data isn't great. In fact, it's, it, it's, it's rubbish. You know, very similar studies going on in England and Wales. So, a crime study in England and Wales, very similar in Scotland. The uh, Scottish Crime and, uh, and Justice survey uh, all highlight in those studies that the prevalence of uh, uh, use of steroids in particular uh, is very low. There's some fantastic research going on for the past few years now uh, in over 20 sites across the UK. Uh, really in depth uh, research, interview led uh, research, we'll cover that in a second as well. Probably the most significant and beneficial data we have across the UK is, is local data and data that's coming from uh, the Nielsen Edge programmes. Okay, for me, something started to change around about 2006 to 2007. You can see this was a, an article by uh, Jim, Jimmy Vay from John Muir's University in Liverpool. I think what Jim is doing here is kind of firing a warning shot almost and saying, look, this is turning into a, a, a significant Problem or a significant group of in, um, <coughs> injectors. You see, it's possible that there's as many people injecting steroids at that time as there is in, injecting heroin. So I think we're all in agreement now, as we mentioned in the introduction, there are far more people injecting the full range of image and performance enhancing drugs than injecting heroin. They may not all become into services, but certainly that's not good for Okay, so this is a Scottish Crime uh, and Justice Study. So you look at the, the year, used in the past year, this correlates exactly with the Crime Study in England and Wales as well. So 0 0.2 of the population that was put the study here, you know, had admitted to using anabolic steroids. Well, that's not anabolic steroids. That's not growth hormone or, or peptides or other tannin agents or anything else. You know, and, it, and it's linked in there with illicit drugs. Now think about how these surveys are, are, are carried out. Household surveys, you know, in Scotland it's sent out to five and a half thousand random households. Well actually changed the last one because somebody came to the door with an iPad and went through it. So you were asked a series of questions about your neighbourhood, about crime, about your perception of crime, about being a victim of crime. And at the end when you bumped your gums about all this and said, have you used any illicit drugs? <laughs> <laughs> and we expect that to be, to, to be reliable. And, and I, I think that's important that you're able to look at that and, and put it into some sort of context, particularly if you're looking to develop your own service or gain funding to, to work with a particular group of clients. <coughs> that's the National IPEDS uh, study I was talking about. It's due to be released in the next, next few weeks. This is a, 
a taster, uh, if you like. So it's over 20 sites uh, across the, the UK, uh, very in depth interviews carried out, looking at what demographics that pe people are using, uh, the side effects uh, the people are experiencing, uh, looks at the, the use of recreational drugs, looks at the, any, any sexual risk behaviour, uh, and every third sample. So the third thought survey, the uh, interviewer is asked to take a dry blood spot sample, which is then sent to uh, an analyst to give some sort of prevalence of blood borne viruses. So you can see there, what's going to be released in the next few weeks is the prevalence of hepatitis B amongst this group was 8.8%, hepatitis C 5.5%, and HIV 1.5%. And that should be by surprise from, from Glasgow, but you're not seeing that. We've carried out over 200 penis blood samples from, from the clinic for blood borne viruses, and more than one positive for hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a chap who was injected other drugs when he was in, when he was in prison. So I think what we're agreeing here is that this, this is pretty much a regional phenomenon, and we need to scratch the surface and establish why that's happening. Is it because prevalence in other areas, you know, maybe it isn't as good? I like to think that's the case because we get an answer then with the case in distribution. Okay, so that's some, some local data from, from Greater Glasgow. Uh, uh, I think like, so it's about 12,000 uh, individuals uh, used the service last year. Uh, we were linked into the real database, so people used to go exchange for the first time, but they then start to use it. We ask a lot of questions about drugs are injected, the frequency, the, the, the housing status, uh, gender, so all that stuff is, is encapsulated. So you can see 28%, nearly 3,500 uh, people in Glasgow last year who used the service for injecting some form of uh, a major performance enhancing drug. So we can't just look at steroids in, uh, in isolation. You know, sizable amount of people using injectable tannin agents and growth hormone and other peptides. 28% of the active population. However, if you then start to look at new clients, last year they raised up to use the service for the first time, they were asked a primary drug of, uh, of injection, then that jumps up to 37%. So 37% of the clients have raised up last year had given some form of uh, iPad as, as, as a primary drug of injection. But look at that. Only 8% of the transactions that were carried out last year were carried out for, for, for iPad users. That's a problem. That's a problem because it means you have a very small window of opportunity in order to engage with this particular client group. So if someone injected heroin or cocaine or you know, other street drugs if you like, you may be lucky enough to see them two or three times a week. So you may be able to drip feed them information. Next time you can buy it, we'll talk about naloxone. Next time you can buy it, we'll, we'll talk about uh, suitable choice of ego for injecting the ferro vein, and we'll talk about proper use of citric or, or whatever. We'll be able to do that bit, bit of that with people that are injecting iPads. You know, see them once or twice, twice a year. And we start to split them down into different groups, which we'll do in a minute. There's so much we really need to think about discussing with them. This is hard data from the Glasgow Drug Crisis Centre. So this is a 24 hour needle exchange based in the, in the Hartnett City Centre. And 56% of clients that the registered last year to use the needle exchange for the iPad users. That's probably my surprise. It's over 24 hours. So it's over times are convenient for people to use. It's good car parking facilities for people to drive up. But again, we started to see that change from, from the crisis centre around about 2007, 2008 when we had the, the, the data through. You know, the client group was changing it. Historically, the crisis centre has worked with some of the most chaotic of heroin injectors in, in Glasgow. And almost, almost overnight, you know, the, the, the client group started to change and that was a real challenge for staff. Staff were very skilled. They're very good at what the people have been injecting heroin and cocaine and other, other street drugs. You know, but they're the group of clients that are injecting drugs that they're familiar with. They're talking about drugs they've never heard of. Standards of law and, you know, 
Fernando Straro and, and, and Andrew and Deccan and you know, what, what, what are these drugs? They were using terminology like stacks and cycles and they just they just didn't understand us really got led to the development of the clinic, which we'll, which we'll talk about. The demographics are different. This is the demographics that we pulled from, <coughs> from Neil. So yeah, you can see the majority of our heroin injectors in Glasgow are, are, are male and imagine that they're pretty similar to, to yourselves, but 91% of you are not even <coughs> when it's iPads. 65% of our heroin injectors are in, in treatment, only 5% of the iPads users. Okay. So that surprised me. I thought, why would 5% of uh, iPads users have been in treatment if we don't really have any treatment for them? So what I was able to do with that was look at all those unique identifiers for, for iPad users and go in client by client and start to look at their, look at their history. <coughs> and essentially, the, the, that 5% is clients that uh, are injecting heroin, but they've decided for whatever reason that they want long green needles, they went to the femoral vein, so, which we don't give out in Glasgow to, to heroin injectors, but they're in our steroid packs. So they then went to the pharmacy, they went to the and they say, I'm injecting steroids. And that thing goes down as well. So you can see heroin and the frequency of everything then that moves on to on the steroids. And that's probably where the 4% uh, homeless or unstable accommodation comes from as well. Slightly younger, <coughs> slightly younger age group uh, as well. And for me, some of the main differences are it's a client group that mainly the full time employment, the living in areas are, 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 are low deprivation, they're able to drive to, to, to your service. Usually in a relationship, or looking for a relationship, or enjoying looking for a relationship, uh, and experiencing few few social social problems. It is a different client group. I personally think the days of us seeing an illegal exchange or can we treat everybody the same should be long gone. I would hope we would treat the young girls injecting melanotan different for the person that's injecting cocaine. I he was treated different for the, the person that was injecting steroids for bodybuilding purposes, and I told he was treated different from someone that was injecting MPS, for example. You know, we need to give a much more individualised approach. Again, this is really just my experience at the, the clinic. I don't think it's particularly helpful to, to, to pigeonhole clients into particular groups, but, but there, there's a purpose here. Probably a largest group of clients are clients who's using for, for image enhancing purposes. And you know, that's, that's significant. It's often a group of people that don't really have that kind of training experience, don't have any real knowledge or proper diet and nutrition. And you then scratch the surface and you go, you know, you want to, to change and improve your, your image. What does that actually mean? I'm oh, looking a wee bit better, I'm a bit partying, a bit clubbing or whatever. Oh, right, okay, so what does partying involve? Often involves the use of recreational drugs, you know, and that image has often become a wee bit more appealing to the opposite of the, of the, of the same sex, you know, so they probably want to start having discussions about, you know, the, the sexual behaviour and things as well, I'm sure they're taking away condoms and so that, that's a very, very significant, significant group. Group of people that are using for athletic, uh, a sports trade, they're thinking about people that are members of uh, a government body, competing bodybuilders. Competing powerlifters, strong men, semi professional rugby players, all come in and use the clinic, all very experienced in their training and their diet and nutrition, and all very regimented in, in what they do. They may have different concerns about drug testing or whatever they're on the body, you know, but very much, very much a regimented regime that they, 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 they would follow. But you know, there's a group of the same size that are doing exactly that, but they're never going to compete, they're not just competing, they're not members of any government body. Or, you know, do it for any, any kind of sports reason if, uh, if you feel like a very knowledgeable and, and, and committed, committed group. People use for occupational reasons. The most obvious one here is people that are involved in some sort of security. You know, stand at the door at a nightclub or whatever, or collecting some money. And it's why you doing that. I used to work in a, a maximum security prison. I did so for 14 years. Shorts prison in, in, in Lanarkshire. It was a horrible, macho type environment. At the time I worked there, in my twenties, I was, I was a competing bodybuilder. Uh, and it was bizarre. The gym was also the heart of this maximum security prison. You can imagine how macho the gym was. Once a year, 
we used to have a staff in prison, a pillar if you call the prison. <laughs> we really, and it always ended up in fights about who was taking the work. You know? uh, so occupational is wider than that. You look at an occupation where it's male orientated and it's certainly about fitness or whatever. The people I feel really, really sorry for just now are personal trainers. You know, I think gone are the days where personal trainers are chosen because of their experience or because of their qualifications. Certainly for a guy choosing a, a personal trainer, you know, tends to choose a personal trainer on that person's physique. You know, uh, what you're looking for, I want to kind of look like you. So these guys are under extreme pressure, you know, to pack on a significant amount of muscle. And, you know, so previously they have never considered using steroids before, you know, with the occupation of sort of labor. And I think it's a group of people that have, have never really been explored, and it's people that are suffering from some form of body dysmorphia. I know the most logical way to look at the body dysmorphia and the steroid use is someone who looks at them as a negative body image of herself, and they take steroids to try, and, to try and change that. That's not what we see. We see this body dysmorphia developing through time. Genuinely, I've lost count in the room of guys that sat across me. 17, 18, 19 stone. You see, if you have been doing over the past few months, I've lost two pounds. You know, and, and it's like, I, I, I mean, you do start to explore that a wee bit more. Okay, so two pounds. How often do you weigh yourself? Seven or eight times a day. How do you weigh yourself at work? I take skills into the work with me. Okay, what about getting your top off and actually checking your physique out? Probably about the same, same amount of time. Now, for most people here, that probably seems quite, quite irrational. The very rational that people are that, 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 that are experiencing it. You know, maybe it's not that different for other disease members such as such as anorexia. I think it's a, a, it's, it's a fantastic piece of work <coughs> waiting wait to be done. So it's developing, developing through time. And that then becomes really, really significant because if people are so fearful of just losing a bit of that muscle that they've, they've put on, it means that they stay on much longer. We never want to come off. And then we start to see really significant there we are. Yes, I, I'm living in action right for this. Well, I'm talking aside, look, look at how things have developed since 1966. Well, you didn't even have abs back then. It's an ISIS action line or something. Back in the bigger. Look at the things that happen to Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this most classic, I'm most classic to remember that. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's an ever increasing range of uh, that, uh, substances being used. It's still mainly <clears throat> steroids. A large group of people are injecting steroids into muscular. You know, huge amount of people now using human growth hormone, particularly to come down to price. We're seeing a lot of peptides emerging. The best way to think of these peptides are similar to new psychoactive drugs. You know, so they've been produced you know, in China, never really been tested. You know, the people that's made them does some sort of uh, wiki page. The guy you think of buying them, then he's on the wiki page and he says, these are the best thing ever. We gave them a, a, a rat in a lab and, you know, the rat put one four stone or something like that. It was about <laughs> people that say that. Yeah, there's a lot of similar medication being, being used. Well, with pretty sound rationale, I have to say. Okay, that's a pretty huge wall chart that I produced with a uh, Andrew uh, present from Exchange Supplies. It's fairly common for us to have uh, visitations to the client where people come in and they'll and, and, and shadow. And I found it quite frustrating, probably, you know, at the end of the night, when having a debrief with the staff, which there's just there, 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 there's so many different substances here. I'll never be able to get my head around, around all this. So mind you behind the, 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 the wall chart, it's not made for clients, incidentally. It's <laughs> wait, look at that. Um, was to really try and simplify things for, for frontline workers. You know, so if you start to read it down in uh, some individual sections, you'll see there for, for all steroids, for injectable steroids, there's a Sunday name, yeah, there's a brand name, and there, there's a street name. What we also want to know then is the half-life, how long is that acting system, because that's going to dictate injecting the uh, frequency. We want to know if it aromatizes, that means if it converts into estrogen or, or not, which can cause significant 
uh, problems, if it's liver toxic, and then an average dose that the people take. So the idea behind that would be the person comes in, they say I'm taking EQ, remember it's that good one, EQ, okay, so that's called on, how much you take, I'm taking 800 milligrams per week, uh, one injection, they'll go on and go, oh wow, okay, that's twice as much as other people need to be taking. It's only an indicator, you know, just to try and simplify. Um, probably the most important thing with the, the, the low steroids is looking, particularly low steroids, that are damaging the liver. You know, there's only a few, you know, have, have, have low potential, most, most of them have the potential to be damaging to, to, to the liver. And their dose becomes very, very important as well. The majority of steroids that are on the market just now are circulating and made in the uh, underground labs. Uh, even your traditional veterinarian steroids are made <coughs> in, uh, in, in underground labs, and the concentrations are getting higher and higher. The concentration of oil, there's not so much steroids you can put into your milliliter oil, but with, with the tablets, it's becoming quite worrying. And for people that are just starting off taking steroids, there's something about well, taking tablets is okay, you know, nobody really wants to. To take jet, but so doubling up your tablets. Well, the labs are now producing tablets at 10 times the strength as well, you know, uh, provided in a medicinal format, so it's very, very easy to consume too, 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 too much. I'll, I'll link that in blood tests and uh, 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 So, your injectable steroids, your oral steroids, aromatase inhibitors, and selective estrogen receptor modulators are just a group of drugs that try and combat the effect of estrogen. Some try and stop the testosterone converting to estrogen in the first place. Others will actually deal with estrogen. Estrogen is a female hormone. And for guys, there's a lot of female hormones circulating in the system. Uh, it's it's, it's a good, seldom a good thing. So people are there and try to keep that under control. Post cycle therapy is a combination of three drugs that are taken on cessation of a steroid cycle. So after someone's taking steroids for you know, 10, 12, 14, 16 weeks, the natural testosterone production is totally shut down. It can take a long, long time for that, that to start again. That can be an awful place for people to be. We're talking very low, almost non-existent testosterone. They associate testosterone with all muscle. Testosterone does hundreds of things in the body. If you're regulating, regulating mood to bone density to, you know, so people talk about a, 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 a steroid crash, never underestimate how severe that can, 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 can be. In <coughs> fact, the big, big issue we have just now is people that have been using steroids, high dose for an extended, extended period of time, they maybe stopped using three or four months ago, and of course the testosterone is still short, it's still not warm. They probably don't associate that with their previous use of steroids, and that may be when they go and visit the GP. They're very unlikely to go to the GP at that point and say, uh, well, doctor, you know, I'm, 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 I'm feeling really low, I've got problems with my partner, there's erectile dysfunction issues going on, you know, I can't get myself out of bed in the morning, and, you know, all well, because I was taking steroids. They'll go with the symptoms. So somebody goes in the doctor and they say, you know, look, like, I've, I've, I've really got no libido. You know, and if I've got any libido at all, and I've got problems keeping an erection, it's got something to do or they go in and they say, you know, just a more motivation in life, I'm continual lethargic, I'm struggling to bed out in the morning, my work's starting to suffer, and end up with a prescription for, for, for antidepressants. You know, it's never really been explored with the, uh, with the GPs. So for most people who are, are using steroids on a fairly regular basis, yeah, you've only ever had one serious steroid crash, and people will either want to go there again. You know, uh, post-psychotherapy is a way of kick-starting that natural testosterone production again. One of the drugs called the HCG just re-stimulates the testicles, brings them back up to size, primes them, the other drug clothing, stimulates a part of the brain called the hypothalamus to release gonadotropin releasing hormones, uh, tamoxifen and lomadex, selectively blocks you through that full axis and allows, uh, allows testosterone production to start again. So there, there is a bit of science uh, behind that. Okay, so that's post-psychotherapy drugs. Uh, fat loss and thyroid drugs. Two of the most common drugs taken for, for, for weight loss is, uh, is T3 and T4 thyroid medication. Not as particularly uh, effective, I have to say. One of the more effective ones is clenbuterol, which is an anti-asthmatic drug, works by raising the body temperature. But people have uncontrolled shaking when it does, it's enough to burn, burn fat. You know? yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah, stacks as well. Yeah, T5 is it? it's not a thyroid hormone, it's, it's a stack of ephedrine, caffeine, and uh, aspirin. It's used to take for two weeks or two weeks off, it's just fairly effective. Uh, DMP is probably the most, probably the most dangerous, but 9 to 16 deaths uh, worldwide, uh, and it's still fairly easy to pick up on, on, on the internet uh, as well. As I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, you know, <coughs> uh, hand swords and Things most most are designed to mimic uh, natural uh, growth, growth hormone. I think very very few actually actually work. And even with growth hormone, we've now carried out it's only 14 tests, but it's 14 tests nonetheless. So for people that have been on growth hormone for more than, more than six weeks, the test of what you can't test on growth hormone because it's so short lived. But growth hormone stimulates the liver to produce uh, insulin like growth factor. So you can test for insulin like growth factor. So we carried out 14 blood tests, and only two of those blood tests have come back showing any sort of elevation. So we know the vast majority of people are taking growth hormone, aren't, aren't taking growth hormone. But it's the easiest thing in the world to, to rip somebody off with. Because you'll not see any benefits for growth hormone until three or four months has passed. You know, so people will come in and they'll swear that the growth hormone that they're, they're, they're taking is dynamite. You know, it's really good stuff. So what's happened in that past three or four months is when they go to the gym, they'll spend the £300 a month in growth hormone. So they are going to the gym, they're starting to watch with eat. So if you're starting to watch with eat, you're training really hard, you go to the gym, you're going to see significant changes to your physique anyway, for a bit, a, a bit hope. You know, and of course, it'd be really back to, 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 the, to the growth hormone. So that's something we're keeping for so as it is. Okay, kind of patterns of use, probably the term they've started to use already. People talk about stacking. I think of this as polydrug use. Very seldom people use one steroid, one steroid only. We usually take a combination of steroids or two or three steroids plus growth hormone, a peptide or a tanning agent as well. That's that stacking. Cycling is the length of time someone will be taking. So maybe eight weeks, ten weeks, twelve weeks, sixteen weeks, sometimes far longer than that. Now, the off cycle should really match the on cycle. So if someone's using it for two weeks, essentially they should have two weeks off. Very seldom, very seldom once in a Pyramid involves in starting low, working its way up, and then start to tail it off kind of again. There's no real rationale for pyramid. Yeah, it's always good for people to take a test those or two, but you know, there, 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 there's no sort of reason for pyramid. Last day cruise it is something that's come out over the past four or five years, which is quite running. Last day cruise is a term that people use for taking very high dose steroids for a period of time and then they reduce the amount of steroids they're taking you know, for a period of time and they go back onto the blast. But blast day cruise is continual use. You know, if you're suppressing your own natural testosterone production, you've got the cardiovascular system under a lot of pressure. You know? It's like working with somebody who's drinking I don't know, a bottle of whiskey a day and they say, you know, I'm going to be sensible of this, I'm going to take a bottle of whiskey a day for six weeks, then I'm going to drop it to half a bottle of whiskey a day. You know, you would still expect to see significant, significant issues and we do with, with, with that as well. <coughs> it's really easy to identify addictive behavioural patterns through this. You know, people often come into the clinic and they say, I'm only going to use for eight weeks. So for the first four or five weeks, you don't really see any, any difference. Then week five, six, seven, they're starting to notice and they're starting to notice changes. They think, well, I'm okay, well, I'm due to stop next week. I'll keep it going for 10 weeks, which is only 12 weeks. When they get to six weeks and not see as, as much improvement as they like, so then they start to drastically increase the range of steroids that they're, they're taking. There's more added to the mix as well. You know, two dissimilar patterns we see for the other forms that are <coughs> Certainly one thing I've done for people to start starting with is have a start date for them and then we project the, 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 the end date as well if you don't need that you can discuss with them why that is, why that is difficult to, to, to do. But you have to bear in mind that the majority of people certainly use, use the clinic and use the steroids are, are very inexperienced, very inexperienced for the vast majority they're only ever going to use two or three cycles. Anyway, it's like everybody day joins the gym in January and you know, I'm going to go five times a week and I'll be in a bikini by the summer and, you know, you know, like, it's actually hard work, you know, I'm going to jump up here and work all day and, you know, so for this group it's, it, it's very similar, so I think it's quite as to keep it safe as possible, 
passe en passe Der er ikke løb, jeg får, at der bliver en vask. Så hvis nogen kommer fra Pippo i Kvang, der vil have flere fyldere sig på. Og man siger, at faktisk snitter i sådan en ting, og der bliver sammen med den ene eneste form, man tager op. Og jeg siger, at i start til at være alle fange, så er det ikke til at snitte, så er det ikke til at træne. Sometimes it's changed rubbings, they more change two or three times a week, and it's not proper, but more often than not, it's a stick with the diet. So, so okay, how's your diet? You want the diet? It's really good. So, okay, so let's just look back over the past few days. What did you have this morning uh, for breakfast? I don't have a breakfast. I get something when I get to work. Okay, so what did you have when you get to work? I had a Roman sausage off the pan. Remember? I'm looking a bit more on the snack. What was that? I don't have a bit more on the snack. Okay, in your lunch, what did you have for your lunch? I had a pie for my lunch. Okay, and then went to the gym. So you then say, okay, you then have a bodybuilding lifestyle. So an average bodybuilding diet for a day, and not the moment, for six egg whites, one egg yolk, and a bowl of porridge at Newsly, half past ten, then a tin or two of uh, 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 sardines, for half past one, a large chicken breast and brown rice, and some steamed veg. Have your workout, the day coming after your workout, the good quality whey protein and all the dextrin. Uh, but an hour after that, you're looking for something like sweet potatoes, a nice bit of fuller steak, or a tuna steak, and a tub of cottage cheese before bed. Every day, and that's genuine. So people are expecting these, you know, fantastic gains uh, because I take loads of steroids. But the biggest thing here is absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> uh, okay, so we established the clinic in 2009, really because we were aware for the uh, needle change data that I had, that, you know, the, the client that was changed far more people start to use steroids. So the clinic was set up to try and provide support to you know, not just the fixed sites in, in, in Glasgow, all the pharmacy and uh, machines as well. Uh, what's on a drop-in basis on a Tuesday evening between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock? Uh, the staff with two workers. Uh, and we have a, a bottle of virus nurse and a supporter with the medical mm -hmm. officer. That just needs a sense so that's it there with the medical officer once a week through the clinical kind of test and things like that. And it's basically once we've got crisis and that's important to us over 24 hours a day and that's where the majority of the clients were using and they were able to identify the, uh, the increase in use. Here that's the, the poster, the, 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 the first poster we developed and we went around all the, all the gyms in Glasgow, all the kind of private corporate gyms and all the kind of hardcore bodybuilding gyms and asked them to put the posters up and they all said yes to it, so we left them. We went back around two weeks later and not one gym had put them up. Do you know I get it? The corporate ones probably don't want to highlight the fact that potential customers are customers that people could be using steroids and the kind of hardcore gyms and loads of people are using are selling steroids and probably don't want to highlight that fact, you know. I think for us, the, the best referrals that came from uh, word of mouth, some discussion within the clinic on uh, different bodybuilding forums, and we have a fantastic relationship with uh, the major dealers in Glasgow. So people are selling steroids, or come into the come into the clinic, they take away a lot of equipment with them. Uh, we ask them then, yep, to give people enough to get started, but to also ask you guys to come down to the to come down to the clinic. Which they do. And we know that works because the guys that come in say, Big X asked me to come down and see you show me how to inject. You know, so it's almost a, a, a form of outreach that we would never be able to never be able to uh, to do. So the aim of the clinic was to provide a special but accessible service uh, as well. We were aware for the demographics, you know, that the majority of people were, uh, were working, the majority of people were able to, to travel to, to, to the clinic as well, park the cars, and so it had to be accessible for us. Uh, to raise our awareness of uh, what about viruses, we were aware as a group that were mainly uh, injecting. We wanted to identify for, for the individual, also for ourselves, the other range of harms that were potentially uh, occurring. Uh, look at alternatives, particular alternatives to, to steroid use. For those who inject, it was trying to prove the inject in 10 weeks, but also to make people aware of the larger program as well. So okay, there's, there's two things, there's what clients want from a service, this type of service, and what, what clients need. Well, yeah, they want, they want needles. We need large amounts of needles. Now, if someone's injecting testosterone, short acting testosterone, uh, short acting trembling, and they're also using glofilmon every day, you know, for 16 weeks, they'll, they'll have to leave there with the 500 needles. 
there was also secondary distribution going on, even for one other person, then they're leaving maybe a thousand needles. You ain't going to do that in packs, you know, so that needs to be needs to be able to as well. One of the best tools we have at the clinic is a calculator. You can actually sit down and just with the person work out how many injections are going to take place. You know, and I, I think that can be very surprising for somebody over that 16 week period when you talk about how many injections are, um, are going to be happening. And you're sitting there working out, okay, so you'll need one needle for drawing, so we need to get them ready for you. You need to change that, you need a needle for, for, for injecting this particular muscle group. You know, because you're injecting so frequently, we're going to ask you to retain your sites, so you need a slightly different needle for injecting this particular muscle group, you know, and it's a large amount of equipment that, that then builds uh, up as well. Yeah, they need an explanation of how the particular steroid or how the particular iPad that they're taking works, and I related that earlier to the kind of jigsaw, and that's a fantastic opportunity to help people look at reducing the amount of different substances are taken or reducing the, the dose or the, the, the potential potential cycle there. You know, there's a number of ways to number of ways to do that. You can explain genuinely that often the steroids are less is more. You don't need huge big doses and you can work out the financial saving. So if you're then able to say look you potentially get a saving of two hundred pounds a month. Now, if you were to put that £200 a month in there, you know, natural supplementation, a proper mm -hmm. diet, you would receive far better gains, which is genuine, absolutely genuine. Uh, yep, yeah, okay, yeah. Preparation and uh, um, demonstration, I think, are, are, are very important as well. You know, I see the client quite a bit often having, you know, come in a bit of near any known syringe to, 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 to use myself. Uh, I'll tell you what this really so for, for younger clients, particularly younger clients if they haven't bought the steroids, they will talk about their own natural hormone levels are there to demand at any particular point, you know, we can do kind of lay in with them there as well, and then they come back four or five weeks later and, and chat any, chat any progress. We uh, can talk about potential side effects and potential harms and risks that, that, that may, may occur. I'm sure you'll see these are photographs that I share, I share with clients. Uh, and, and for us, blood tests are absolutely invaluable. I, I couldn't picture running the clinic now without, without blood tests. <laughs> People often present at the clinic with some form of side effect, probably fifty percent. The people now that they, they, they come to the clinic as with some issue they want want to help with, <coughs> either 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 on cycle or or, uh, or, or off cycle. Okay, just finish it off. Uh, Okay. Well, in the process of analysing, but you managed to do 301 already. You get another couple of hundred to, to do. So we, we take once post cycle, once someone's finished their steroid cycle, and when I say we're trying to see if the natural testosterone level has, has started again, we're trying to look at the there's any damage to the livers or, 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 or the kidneys. So you can see there for those post cycle ones, 43 percent showed that normal liver function. Then we can relate a lot of that to some oral steroids. 43% showing that normal kidney function, possibly the same, but high dose uh, uh, diets, high protein can also give you a slightly abnormal uh, uh, kidney result as well. 41% showing that the hormones released by the brain, luteinizing hormones and follicle starting hormones, involved in the production of testosterone, uh, are suppressed. And 39% showing that abnormal testosterone. In the post cycle therapy, was talking about for 68% who followed. A uh, program we developed by a chap in America called Dr. Scally, 68% had, had recovered, but for those who had followed that, who hadn't recovered, there's a number of caveats there. So somebody says, yeah, you know, I've done my PCT, I followed this PCT, you know, you, you draw the blood and the testosterone is through the roof. So they're just coming out in the clinic, they say they've done a PCT because that's what we test, but they just want to check if the testosterone they're taking is, is, is good or not. Yeah. 39% of those who do their own kind of form of a PCT, it's not involved with the same drugs, but by a different time scale, uh, had recovered and 37% had chosen not to use a PCT, had, uh, had recovered, and that'd be some period of time after. after so, we were dedicated over 200 blood tests from the lead one positive for the for, for, for hepatitis. So, and that should be a bit of change, so. Yeah. Yeah. There we go, that, absolutely. Okay. So if you, you, you know, if you're looking to develop your own, your own service, be aware of the skill and nature of use, you know, within your vicinity. You know, and your, your household service isn't going to give you that, 
that data. Uh, if you want to inject the equipment into this client group, there has to be insufficient quantities, there has to be you know, equipment paid in the right city as well. You know, we have to consider location and, uh, and open times, unfortunately for us. That means our hours are rough to run the clinic on Wednesday morning, you know, unfortunately we're starting at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, your service, be prepared for it to end up a, a comprehensive service because it will probably end up a comprehensive service. You know, uh, bloods are advantageous for us, bloods have become an essential part of the, the, the clinic as well. And ask about harms, and harms will be presented to you. And I think it's important, well, any group, you know, we're not working in isolation, you know, we've come much better partnership. Thank you.